2023 Kıraathane Kitap Şenliği kapsamında Siren Yayınları'nın düzenlediği bir kitap sohbetiyle karşınızdayız. Geçtiğimiz Mart ayında e, Siren Yayınları'ndan çıkan Yakınlıklar kitabını yazarı Lucy Caldwell ile konuşacağız. Kitabın çevirmeni olarak bu kitabı bu söyleşiyi gerçekleştirmekten büyük mutluluk duyuyorum. Sohbete başlamadan önce yazarın e, kısa bir biyografisini paylaşmak isterim. Lucy Caldwell 1981'de Belfast'ta doğdu. Cambridge Üniversitesi Edebiyat Bölümünden birincilikle mezun oldu. Daha sonra çeşitli okullarda yaratıcı yazarlık ve oyun yazarlığı eğitimi aldı. Öğrencilik yıllarından beri yazıyor. Beş romanı, iki öykü kitabı, çeşitli radyo ve tiyatro oyunları var. Bunlardan bazılarıyla ödüller de kazandı. Halen Faber Akademi'de öykü yazarlığı dersi veriyor. Şimdi yazarla sohbetimize başlıyorum ve İngilizceye geçiyorum. Hello Lucy, thank you for joining us today. And I would like to thank you for intimacies. It's a beautiful story collection and I feel so privileged for being the Turkish translator of the book. Thank you, um, so it's lovely to meet you and I can tell from the amount of messages in Turkish that I'm yeah. tagged in um, on, on social media. What a beautiful rendition you have made of the work. And so I think any credit because the book is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so before I begin with my questions, I'd like to express my gratitude to my dear friend uh, Sanem Sirar, the co-founder of Sirar Publishing, for her valuable input in shaping these questions. Uh, I would also like to extend my thanks to the book's editor, dear Müge Çavdar, for her significant con- contributions to the translation. Yes. Uh, firstly, I'd like to discuss the central theme of the book. While I read the book, I found that you skillfully examined the intricate nature of intimacy, both as an emotion and as a concept. And you show that its existence can be uh, profoundly empowering, while its absence can lead individuals to experience profound loneliness and isolation. What made you think about this aspect of human condition so deeply? That's such a good question, and thank you. Um, <clears throat> when I was writing the book, I, what I love about a collection of short stories is that you can approach the same theme or the same themes obliquely and elliptically um, again and again. With my first collection, Multitudes, I saw that as a cubist portrait of young womanhood. Um, in that collection, which also has 11 stories, I thought that even if superficial biographical details change, like maybe in one story a narrator has a brother, in another she has two sisters, in another she's an only child, I thought even if superficial details like that change, I want the sense that it can be a cubist portrait of a whole life. Um, and when I, Intimacies is very much a sister volume to that. And when I was writing that, I was starting to write, I wanted to find a way of writing. I'd started to write, I'd started to think about intimacy when I was writing Multitudes, in part because I needed to find a literary form for me that allowed for a greater intimacy than the first person. I write a lot of stories in the first person because I'm a playwright. And so I can ventriloquize and and write as a character. So I write a lot in the first person, um, but this was no longer sufficient for the stories that I wanted to tell. And I found a way of using the second person. In English, that's you. You are doing this. You are doing that. And I found a way of writing it that was not asking the reader to role play, mm-hmm. but was asking the reader to be almost a witness to a very important exchange that was happening between the character and the voice in the character's head or the character and a future version of themselves. And I wanted the sense that I wanted the reader to get as close to the story as possible, to be witness to something really important. And so I found that sort of intimacy, that sort of proximity, I found that very formally interesting. And so I was thinking about intimacy, I was thinking of how possible it ever really is to know somebody. Um, one of the things I first, I wrote my first novel at university and it was published the year after. And people would constantly say to me, you're so young, you have nothing to write about. And I would think, I'm so interested in people and I'm so interested that you can meet someone 
maybe they become your friend, maybe they become your lover. And still, how well do you know them? What are the parts of them that you can never know? Um, I'm so interested in that. And as well, I suppose at the same time, I was pregnant with my first and then my second child. And I was thinking about how one of the greatest intimacies that I have known is growing another human being inside me. And then when they're born, you realize that they have nothing to do with you. They are entirely their own person. Yeah. And and the work is in letting them go. If you're a good parent, a good mother, you're letting them go further and further and further until they don't need you anymore. So I was thinking about proximity and closeness. And mm-hmm. so those are some of the some of the technical, some of the formal, some of the personal things that were at play and the collection in a story like all the people were mean and bad um which is set in a transatlantic flight you have a different translation for that uh, sure. no no actually we, we did we did the literal translation literal translation yeah okay. yeah yeah. Oh, well, in that there's a form of um it's a transatlantic flight so that's a story set over f- physical distance but the real distance in that story is the narrator feeling how far she has come from the place she grew up in, mm-hmm. uh, how far she has come from the person she thought she was. Or the she person could have been an architect, but become a exactly. mother. And, yeah. and how far she feels she's come from the people that she thought she might be. So a sort of psychic distances as well. Yeah. And so the story sets those sort of distances against the intimacy of meeting a stranger on a plane to whom you can confess everything because you're not going to see them again. Yeah. And so I think I've given a very long answer to your question, but it was a very no, no, no. And so I think the interplay of some of those technical, emotional, psychic factors mm-hmm. was very important. I see. And um, also, I mean, given the prominent themes of motherhood and fertility choices in many of the stories, uh, how do women, especially those living in this age, find a space for themselves in literature? How do they succeed in becoming the protagonists of their own stories? And generally, where do women find themselves situated in life and literature? Yeah, another wonderful question. Um, when I was about six months pregnant with my first child I had always wanted children but I had always feared that there's a saying a very famous saying in English coined by a a critic called Cyril Connolly that said who never had children himself and it says the pram in the hallway is the enemy of art Mm -hmm. and I had grown up feeling that that was true that having a child would be the end of my artistic life, the end of my creative life. And so I was torn between very much wanting children, always wanting to have babies, but feeling that would be the end of me artistically. Um, So when I was about six months pregnant, I went to a friend's book launch and she's published by Virago, um, the legendary feminist press over here. Mm -hmm. And we went for dinner afterwards with Lenny Goodings, one of the founders of Virago. And I was asking her, um, what are the great novels? What are the great stories about um, pregnancy, about childbirth, about new motherhood? Because I couldn't find very many. And the way that I have always lived as a bookish child is I read, I read, you know, I read and I read. And I was looking and looking and I couldn't find the stories that I wanted. And we were discussing a handful of stories, um, some classic, some contemporary, but there wasn't very much. There were some great pieces of nonfiction. Something like Anne Enright's Making Babies was a, a talismanic text for me, but there weren't very many stories in fiction. This is 10 years ago now and things have changed a lot since. But Lenny said to me, you'll have to write us some new stories. And so I was thinking about how how few stories there are. And then I was surprised by the fact that when my child was born rather than it being the end of my life as an artist I feel it was the beginning really of me feeling that I was writing in my own voice but people talk so much about voice and I feel that the stories the novels that I wrote before having children when I was in my early 20s 
they never quite felt they were the voice that's in my head. And mm -hmm. suddenly I felt that I had subject matter and I felt that the stories were written in my voice and something else happened where time was suddenly so urgent because I was the primary carer of my babies, partly by financial um, imperative, but mostly by choice. And so I had very, very little writing time, but yet it was so important to me to write. I felt that I was writing for my own artistic survival and something happened in that crucible of circumstances that I started finding that I didn't care what people thought. I didn't care if other people thought these stories mattered or not. They were the stories that I wanted and needed to tell. Mm -hmm. And I've taken such solace in reading writers like um, Barbara Hepworth, whose diaries I was rereading um, this week, The Great Sculptor, um, mm -hmm. and, and the way that she talks about writing and motherhood and the way that I think so many of the great writers of the past um, didn't have children um, because it wasn't possible to be a mother, to fulfill society's expectations, yeah. obligations, and also write. And we're at a, a position now where it is more possible to do that. But I think we lack, we lack so many different pathways and models. I have friends who have been felled by postpartum psychosis, who have mm -hmm. found themselves completely unable to write after having children. You know, there are no universal narratives, but I'm so glad that there is at least one more for me than the the prime in the hallway is the end of art. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, actually, I would have asked this one later, but now I think it's the, just the right moment. Uh, while uh, preparing for this interview, I was, uh, I was, you know, reading your uh, other interviews and podcasts and things mm -hmm. like that and uh, one of, in one of them you expressed your admiration for Lucia Berlin yes. uh, her story collection A Manual for Cleaning Ladies was also published by Siren in 2021 mm -hmm. yeah um, uh, with translation by Eileen Ulcher uh, could you please share what aspects of Lucia Berlin's work that resonates with you so deeply do you believe that the protagonists in Berlin stories intersect with those in your own work? If so, how does this intersection occur? Um, can you please expand that? I think Lucia Berlin for me was a writer I read at exactly the right moment in my own life, in my own writing life. Sometimes that happens very magically. Yeah. Um, for me discovering Laurie Moore when I was 19 or 20, her collection Self-Help was hugely important. Um, Elizabeth Smart by Grand Central Station, I sat down and yeah. wept. That's oh, another yes. that I read. I wouldn't have the same feeling for that if I read it now as I did reading it as a 20 year old. Yeah. But Lucia Berlin, I read her at exactly the right moment in my writing life. And it felt, reading her for me was like walking through a portal. Mm -hmm. It was, such a psychic freedom her stories technically she's amazing she can turn a story on we have a phrase in English an old-fashioned phrase to turn on a sixpence and that means you can you can pivot very quickly you can go from one register to another your sentence can do a very unexpected thing and so formally technically she's brilliant but also what I loved is in my translation of of of um in my version of Lucia Berlin, there's a foreword by Lydia Davis. And Lydia Davis quotes Lucia Berlin's son saying, Ma wrote, Ma wrote true stories, not necessarily autobiographical, but close enough for horseshoes. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I love that. And I love that the idea that you can you can use what you've got and it doesn't need to be confessional. It doesn't need to be uh a splurging it doesn't need to be a giving away you're not lessening yourself by by opening yourself or by giving something away you can use these experiences that you've had and you can return to them you can use them again Lucia Berlin she sometimes returns again and again to the same frequencies or the same feelings and the stories have such a lightness to them she's such an example to me of how you can write very dark things or very complex things mm -hmm. 
you can write them in a technically brilliant, quick silver, um, very light of touch manner. And you can return to them in a different way. And so reading her, it felt, I felt a new freedom, I think, to to to write. Um, and she was also a mother. She was a mother of, of sons. Um, and I think t- to add something else to your, your question about motherhood, I don't think this is universal again, um, but it certainly happened for me that um, becoming a mother was a chance to reassess my own relationship with time in that I think it was a there's a definite before and after and so when when you're considering how do I bring up I have one son and one daughter and when I think how to bring up a boy a young man in today's world how to bring up a girl a young woman in today's world how to bring up a person in today's world you think back to the ways that you were brought up and suddenly you realize how far we've come you know, I, I in one of the stories I write about Monica Lewinsky, and that came from a real moment of, of realizing that Monica Lewinsky was 22 when yeah. all those experiences happened, when she had the whole world's appropriate. She was a she was such a young woman. And I don't think I would have registered viscerally the age she was had I not suddenly felt of a different generation. You know, had I had I so so in a way that was another, I suppose, existential experience of of of motherhood that was very helpful for my writing. Right, right. And uh, actually, I'm gonna change the subject a little bit and ask you about magical realism. <laughs> um, you were at the Jaipur Literature Festival uh, a couple of weeks ago, I guess. I was at the festival in London, the Jaipur Festival. Uh, in- oh, okay, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, it was just a couple of weeks ago. I, I watched a, a conversation on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Jane Carson and yourself were the speakers. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's actually, I wrote it, uh, it's a very long question. I, I'm going to ask the shorter one. Um, and you say that in the in the end of the uh, that magical real realism question you say that uh, what you can do in that moment with the radio is different scenarios you're talking about the first story of the intimacies uh, so that the story then spirals through various different scenarios and goes to the length of the whole lof- lifetimes before coming back to the timeline it's a sort of magical realism actually yeah. but but and you say this right after that uh uh after that, you say that my mind just doesn't work that way. I mean, talking about the writing these kind of stories. Uh, this is a fascinating perspective on a story that initially appears realist in nature, actually. Uh, can you please elaborate on this? Yes, this is, um, I write, I love fairy tales, folk tales. Um, in fact, I have a writer that I've been reading recently, and um, you can help me pronounce the name, um, Sema Kaigusus. Uh, Sema Kaigusus. Yes. Sema Kaigusus, yes. She's she's a wonderful um, Turkish writer. This was translated by Maureen Freely into English. Mm-hmm. And I, there's one of my favorite stories in this book. Um, a man has, a woman has slept with a man, and after she sees his feet, which are so ugly, she suddenly <laughs> decides she doesn't love him anymore. And they go on a walk and the man is trying to show his prowess to the woman, trying to win the woman back. And he finds a young pine tree and he strips the bark of the of the pine tree and cuts and lets the the sap trickle out. And there's a brilliant line in the book about the woman is screaming silently and the pine tree is screaming silently as well because he's killing the pine tree. It's such a, a, a bold and a shocking image. And I love it. I love when I read like that. And I think that this it's something I feel myself inching towards. And it's something that is a bit more there in, in my third collection, actually, um, letting these elements of magic and stories and fairy tales um, seep in a bit more. Um, and funnily, I'd love to hear your take on this, because when I read, say, um, Elif Shafak, talk about one of the one of the realities in Turkey is the overlay the layering of a sort of Sufi mysticism alongside a a contemporary realism you get really interesting 
um, layering, you get really interesting sort of possibilities when these two things are together. And I think that Ireland, similarly, we have such a rich history of fairy tales, of folk tales. Um, and there are some writers who work in a tradition like that. I wouldn't consider myself one of them, but yet I'm so interested in a story like, like this, the ways that you can write a sort of magic realism, not by including folkloric or phantasmagoric elements, not by including flying carpets, but, but by um, doing things with time. And I think that the way that we experience time anyway, we experience it as a sort of consensus reality and a linear reality, but actually time doesn't feel like that. Time doesn't work like that. Um, yeah. Sometimes to me, it feels like all times are layered at once and it's a question of being able to tune in and tune out of them. I certainly felt that when I was writing my book um, these days, set in the Belfast Blitz. I was writing it during April to May 1941 and the Belfast, sorry, the Belfast Blitz happened April to May 1941. I was writing it in <laughs> April to May 2020. That slip was very telling. Mm -hmm. And it did feel to me a lot of the time that I was just by effort of will, psychically tuning out of my reality and tuning into a different time that was still going on. And so I suppose time is something that I play with in my stories. And in a story like, like this, that story was originally written for broadcast on radio. And so I knew that the one thing I had control over was the pace because the listener, the story needed to work on the page as well, but the listener is completely at my mercy. And so in that story, a child goes missing and then the story cycles through decades before coming back to yeah. an ending. And actually True. there is and has, there's a there's a there's a mythological creature in that because there's a big <laughs> creature with ragged wings <laughs> that, that comes in. <laughs> um so so yes, yeah, so I'm really interested, I suppose, in in playing, you know, realism and and ordinary life and it's all it's a consensus reality, I think. Um, and there's no right. such, you know, all realist fiction is a sort of agreed upon representation of something. It's a genre as much as anything else, any other genre of fiction. Right. And uh, I'd like to ask you something about the, your writing style. Mm -hmm. uh, four, four of the stories in the book are written uh, with a second person narrator, which I normally find a bit tricky, <laughs> you know, but in, in your stories, uh, it sounds just right, I believe. Um, I noticed that you primarily use this style when depicting a mother uh, caring for her child or children at that moment. In contrast, the remaining stories are written with either a first-person narrator or a third-person narrator. How do you decide that the reader should or shouldn't directly hear your protagonist's voice? Yeah, a brilliant question. And I'd love to ask you how second-person works in Turkish. Great. It, it, it's, I think, I think, uh, I mean, it's ex gives exactly the same feeling as in English. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was perfect. That's lovely because it, it's funny, Tilin, like you say, I hate the second person. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I it, it, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's because it sometimes just doesn't work. <laughs> but when, and when it doesn't work, it really doesn't work. And sometimes <laughs> as a reader, I feel kind of heckled by it and it makes me feel contrary if someone tells me you are 16 and this is the best summer of your life I start arguing <laughs> back and I start thinking no I'm not and no it isn't <laughs> as, I, as I said earlier for me the second person it isn't performative it isn't mm -hmm. making the reader it isn't corralling the reader it's it's deeply intimate and it's it's inward it's intimate and it's inward it's not performative and outward and so it's not trying to coerce or to force the reader. It's letting the reader be privy to something very, very important. And sometimes I think it's the voice in your head that tells you that something is going to be OK. Or sometimes it, in my stories, I was thinking it might be, a, as I said, it might be a future version of the character talking back. Um, but I like the the inwardness and I like the tenderness of it. Because first person, 
I start to find that some of my stories, sometimes a person, a character wouldn't have enough self-awareness to tell a story or they might be too closed. They might dislike themselves too much. They might have too much shame to tell a story in the first person. Um, or if a story is written in the first person past tense, it's an anecdote, you know, it's already over. And so somehow the stakes are lessened. You're getting the summary of something that happened that was main, that was ma maybe meaningful, but you're not getting the thing itself still, you're not getting the live dilemma. And I think of um, Blanchot who says of the story, the story shouldn't be like recalling the event, the story itself should be the event. And so for me, if some sometimes first person past tense is completely right for a story, sometimes first person present tense. Um, I always struggle with third person because there's no such thing as a neutral observer. All description is opinion. And I always struggle with where does this leave my consciousness? I'm telling, I'm making decisions on behalf of the readers, on behalf of the characters. Um, but sometimes third person... I suppose for me, it's it's an instinctive feeling and it's a tonal feeling. Um, very do rare. Decide, do you decide that, sorry, do you decide that when you started writing the story or you change it while you write it? Yeah, sometimes what I tend to do is say a story like All the People Were Mean and Bad. I thought about that story for a full year before writing any of it. And I had notes on my phone um, and I had transatlantic flight and I had the, the the Bible story and and I had choose your own adventure and I had all these things. And, and I didn't write the story until one morning I suddenly realized the tone that I needed was elegy. And I realized it's literally an elegy because the character is coming back from a funeral. Um, but it's also an elegy for maybe her marriage. It's an elegy for all the people that she isn't going to be, all the experiences that she won't have. It's an elegy for her childhood. And as soon as I heard it was an elegy, I I knew it had to be told in second person because that gave a lovely, soft mutedness. The first person for that story would have been far too declarative. The third person for that story would have been too distant. But the second person worked and the tone of the elegy worked. And I wrote that story in two days, two mornings, once I could hear the tone. And so I think for me, by the time I come to write, the way that I tend to work is I let the, sometimes the character's voice, sometimes just the tone of what they want to say, um, kind of bubble up in me until I have to start writing it. And so very rarely do I, sometimes I might change between tenses, I might change between present and past tense, and. And anyway, I like to use tense more fluidly. I like to use tense as maybe Rosamund Lehman or Elizabeth Bowen or Virginia Woolf, some of those great stylists of the 1920s. Yeah. They're very fluid with tense. You know, they, they change tense according to mood, according to tone. So I, I play about with tense, but I think generally by the time I start writing a story, I know that that the form that it should be written in. Yeah, um, actually, uh... Close to this question, I'd like to ask you about something else. Uh, you write in various forms, including novels, plays, stories. Uh, when you decide on a central theme and be begin begin to write about it, how do you determine uh, which form to employ? Hmm. I, when I started, I wrote short stories for 10 years without any of them being any good. I always think of, there's a beautiful poem of Sylvia Plath's, very chilling poem called Stillborn. And she imagines the poems that she's written that fail to live. And she imagines them in glass mason jars, glass apothecary jars. And she says, they smile and smile and smile at me, but still their lungs won't fill and their hearts won't start. And I wrote stories, I always loved stories and I would write them and maybe they would have a flicker of life, but they wouldn't live. And it took me three novels, several stage plays, radio dramas, to have enough of the technique to make short stories work. And moreover than that, I think it was 
realizing that when you write a short story, for years I got them wrong because I saw them as miniature prose narratives. Mm -hmm. And maybe my short story would have a really good plot or it would have good character. And I would think, I don't know why this doesn't work, but there's no magic. You know, it's fine, but it's inert. And then I realized that I was approaching stories the wrong way. I was seeing them as, as miniature novels and they're not at all. For me, a short story has much more to do with a poem. Um, it has the, the blank space around it, the heightened nature of it. It has much more to do with a stage play um, that, that that exists at a certain pitch. You know, if any of my stories, if you elongate it, you could not elongate them to a novel. They would be too much. They would be overwrought. They wouldn't work. They, they just couldn't be sustained. But when I started seeing my stories as Again, like the Blanchot as the event itself, not a not a rec recollection of the event or a recounting of the event. I started thinking of them personally as spells. And I started thinking of them as words and rhythms to evoke a particular atmosphere or sensation. And so that really freed me up because some of my stories have a lot of plot. Some have almost no plot at all, but the plot doesn't matter. It's all about the intensity of the feeling, the intensity of the experience. And I think this is, I talked about how I always listen to short stories and I grew up playing the violin from when I was um, five, four or five, I played Suzuki violin, which mm -hmm. is a form of violin where you don't learn to read music, you listen and you repeat it. So for years and years, you just listen and you learn to play by listening. And I always think that with a story, I'm listening to it and listening to the tone of it. And I'm trying to, with a story, I'm trying to, yes, it's a spell for me. It's a spell to to, to capture something. It's a bit more magical. Um, a novel, on the other hand, is, I think, the, for me, a novel is what you have that you don't necessarily have in a story is the unfolding of consciousness over time. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to write my novel these days after writing only short stories for a decade it was really interesting to have that expanse you know sometimes when you're writing a novel I think it feels like you're writing towards one or two very important very heightened moments and the rest of the novel is it's it's building or it's scaffolding or it's cantilevering to get you to that moment and what I love about a story is you're just writing pure moment. You don't need any of the rest of the stuff. Um, but a novel for me, it is it is consciousness over time, I think, is, is its great strength for me. Um, with a play, I love that you're writing only a blueprint. You are you need to write generously enough that actors can come in. You need to write enough there's something ritual there's something sacred you go back to the origins of theatre and it is a religious and communal ceremony and so theatre is slightly different again because you're trying to create space for that particular magic to happen yeah yeah and uh, I think we have just a little time left uh, so lastly uh, I'd like to ask you this uh, uh, what are you working on these days? Is there any new book or new play or can you please yeah, talk I have, about um, Yeah, I have my new third collection um, is called Openings and yes. um, similar, it's got 13 stories. Um, they, yeah, they're, they're, that will be published next year by, um, by Faber next May. So that's coming out. And it's a it's a privilege. Really? Short stories. I mean, I really I struggle to find female short story writers in Turkish translated into English. The short um, there I couldn't find very many. I, I, I can't recall, but I, I I'll check and <laughs> if I find something, yeah, I, I mean I, I I'll let you know. Yeah. But in the UK, the short story is the novel very much is what publishers want, what they want you to publish. And so I feel so fortunate with Faber that they're bringing out my new collection. And I feel so fortunate that with um, Siren, I mean, I think this is my favourite cover of the collection. It is, isn't it? It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. And I feel so fortunate and also, that those stories think, have a readership. Yeah, do you think the cover is also reflects the, the 
the thing you mentioned in your first answer, you know, the cubic. Uh, yeah, I, that's what I love it. Yeah. And in in, in um, intimacies and in multitudes, uh, none of my narrators had names. Um, mm -hmm. Funny thing, it felt too distancing giving them a name. You know, it felt it felt I wanted them to stay more interior. And so for this reason, this feels I couldn't come up with an image that describes better what I was what I was doing. <laughs> I love great, I love that image. Yeah. Great, great to hear that. And um, thank you so much for, you know, uh talking to us today. It was a great conversation. And I'm also very glad to meet you even on Zoom. And you know, thank you so much, Lucy, for your pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. My too. pleasure. Thank you.